We're going to take you back through Ian's journey. Okay, so we've looked at Ian and his general assessment, which is really vital, please. And there's lots of things I've probably missed because we haven't got time to say. But general things, looking for any anemia, any blood disorders, anything that might affect his wound healing, because just general anemia in your patients will delay wound healing. Okay, so any other factors like that, that will be part of your general assessment. We looked at the limb assessment, the shape of the limb, the colour, the perfusion, any signs and symptoms of, of lipodermatosclerosis or venous disease. We looked at an ABPI and a vascular assessment and the wound itself, concentrating very much on the wound bed, biofilms, infection, exudate being the moisture and also the peri-wound skin. And then we, we want to move on to look at compression therapy because as we know, I hate the word gold standard, but I think through years and years of VLU treatment, we know compression is essential. Okay, what I will say to you is some of your patients will also require surgery or, or interventions to improve any uh, valve dysfunction in the veins or varicose veins. There's lots of new treatments now, very simple, low invasive treatments. So please don't rule that out for your patients. Refer those patients on um, and the vascular team can look and establish whether they're suitable because that will help with, pre with prevention. It also will help with some of our patients and I hate hate it when some clinicians or particularly doctors say oh I'm not referring you on to the vascular team those varicose veins are just cosmetic um, well I will always be that patient's advocate because it isn't just about cosmetics it's about good venous return and preventing that backflow of blood so let the consultant decide that um, and, and refer those patients on or certainly support that referral on Okay, so compression, as I've just said, it has to be a really good first line, not a week later, not seven weeks later, not because it's not healing now. It has to be on and, and it will optimise um, not just venous return, reduction of edema, lymphatic drainage. It's going to promote wound healing because we're getting that really good blood flow down to the wound and that good return, taking away, what, taking away waste products, carbon, carbon dioxide, etc. So it really is important in acute and chronic wounds. And one thing I failed to say is any, any lower limb that develops a wound. So for instance, practice nurses out there, your pretibial lacerations, um, trauma wounds, summers coming, rose bushes, you name it, shopping trolleys, etc. etc. Compress them if they're suitable. They respond extremely well. Because I'll guarantee if you've got a traumatic wound, there will be some edema around that wound, peri wound or the limb itself. And if it's safe to compress, they will respond, the wound will respond extremely well to compression. So don't just think compression for VLU, do think compression for those other acute wounds or chronic wounds um, that are failing to heal. Okay? And compression as we talk to our patients and it has to be a conversation you have from day one and they do look at you as if horrified that compression it's for life it is for life you know if somebody had diabetes and they're on insulin or metformin or whatever medication they wouldn't stop because their diabetes was under control would they venous insufficiency is the disease and it's venous disease doesn't just get cured it's for life. So when that ulcer, God forbid they've even got an ulcer, I don't want them developing that ulcer, but that disease doesn't go away because you've healed the wound. And this is what we've got to inform our patients. That disease is present, will always be present. So we have to have good skin care, good hygiene and compression to suit them. Okay? And we have to start that conversation really much, very well, definitely from the beginning. So if we recap on here, and he's got a VLU, he's suitable for compression, as we said, and he's daunted, he's in pain. As I've just said, we went through all the TIMES acronym, which will help us, because what the TIMES acronym does is they, they are all barriers to wound healing if we don't get them right. So if you treat each one of those acronyms and assess and treat them properly, most of your barriers to wound healing will, will be managed, okay? And you can start and move the wound on. So... What level of compression then would you use for Ian? So those with the voting pads, reduced, full, no compression, or you're not sure? So let's have a little look then. Okay, some said reduced, 
Majority <coughs> said 72%, um, which is great. Some are unsure, and I understand that. You, you might not be, you're not sure whether it's reduced or full. I'm not picking on anybody, I'm not looking at anybody. What is some of the rationale, and I have, I have seen this before, of using reduced compression? What is some of the rationale why we would go for reduced tolerance? tolerance? So is that because of pain? I'm not, I'm not looking at it. Yeah, yeah. So maybe pain is the issue. Okay, yeah, I can understand that. Why else would you, you might consider in Ian's case you're going to use reduced? He, he didn't want it in the first place, so he's already daunting. So you think, I'll start a little bit and move on. <coughs> Sorry? The DVT. the DVT. Yeah, I can totally respect all of those answers. He's daunted by the thought of compression. He's in pain, because I told you that earlier, didn't I? And he has had a previous DVT. With the DVT, it's better to compress than not compress. So I understand that. But a couple of years ago, when I was working, we were told not to compress a limb that had had a recent DVT. So you can see, again, it's, it's breaking down that tradition. I can understand <coughs> he's daunted by the thought of compression, and he is in pain. But the sooner you can get full compression on, guess what will happen to his pain? It'll reduce because a lot of his pain is due to the edema, the raised venous, retur venous pressure and the wound itself. But no way would I just suddenly go to Ian, right, here you go Ian, I'm going to put you in full compression unless I've done a pain assessment. And pain assessment has to be from day one because it's not just about the compression, it's about your wound management as well, isn't it? Would Ian allow me to debris soft his wound, put emollients to his skin, put a wound dressing on if he was in extreme pain? Probably not. And probably once I go out the door or he leaves my practice or he leaves the ward, he'd probably take it off because he's in pain. And a lot of patients find that when they take dressings off, and, and, and there is the myth, you know, expose it to the air, but they actually say when nothing's on it, it feels better. So we have to get their pain managed. Because all the will in the world, me standing here with new dressings, new products, compression therapy ranges, unless the patient's fairly comfortable, pain's managed, you, you, you're not going to achieve that. So you, you're totally right. In some of our patients where the pain is not managed and we have to get it managed, we may start with reduce. But if you can, from day one, full compression. Because your compression is going to resolve some of the issues, the majority of issues that are causing the pain. But if you have to wait for analgesia to, 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 you know, to be prescribed, etc., etc., then some compression is better than none. Okay? But always tell the patient when you put them in reduced compression, if you're going to uh, increase it to full, we will be increasing this. This is only a temporary measure, okay? Because otherwise they'll just go, no, um, you know, Nurse Smith who came the other day said, I've only got to have this on and why are you now putting me in this, okay? So reduced compression is therapeutic for VLUs. I understand the rationale of why we would at some point put reduced on. But whilst some compression is better than none, we should always aim for full compression, okay? Um, where it's deemed appropriate to do so. Because reduced compression, you know, may be fairly comfortable, the patient may reduce a little bit of the edema, but it won't speed up that healing process as quick, okay? So it isn't just about the wound, it's about the, um, the um, not just about the limb, it's about the wound as well. So the group also looked, but it's something I did three years ago, and I've just been having a chat with a, a nice colleague over there about some work we did in Shropshire three years ago for, through a crisis in a surgery, in, in a practice, uh, not because, you know, of any other reason, but it was back on, uh, anybody heard of the Venus 4 study back in 2014, Venus 4 leg ulcer study? It was a really good, big RCT, randomised controlled trial. And this three years ago made me stop, and it made me stop and fall off that hamster wheel that I'm often on, running and running and getting nowhere, and think, God, why don't we just put this into practice? And the, part of the, the Venus 4 study is what we've put in the best practice statement, which I'll go on to discuss with you. And that looked at healing rates in, in compression bandage system, a multi-layer compression bandage system, compared to healing rates for a, a VLU in a hosiery kit. The only difference was a day. The biggest thing that stuck out to me, particularly being a community practitioner, is that the healing rates, uh, the reoccurrence rates, 
were reduced by half in those in hosiery kits compared to those in bandaging. And again, I'll talk to you about that in a minute. But that was a summary of some of the, the, the work we were looking at. What we also want you to do in the group is to give self-care solutions. Because as I keep harping on about, and I know I get on my soapbox, we are not going to have the number of clinicians, registered general nurses, etc., in the next five to ten years. We know that. The student bursary's just been stopped. We know this is going to have a knock-on effect. So also the five-year forward plan, the NHS five-year forward plan, if any of you have had a little bit of bedtime reading, um, but basically it's talking about now encouraging self-care, self-management of diseases, etc, etc, which I know as clinicians and as practitioners we've always been encouraged to do. But I think many years ago it was seen as it was our role, it was our role to get that patient healthy. But there is a lot more care now re regarding self-care models, so self-care models of care. And what we were looking at as well, as summary of the findings, is that we have to have those thera therapeutic levels of compression. They have to be there consistently, okay? And that reduced compression, unless it's deemed appropriate because of mixed etiology, but all we're talking about is VLUs now, it, it, it can be subtherapeutic. It's not really going to benefit your patients fully or as quickly as, as you can. Okay, um, and compression therapy, or mu as much as when you first talk to your patients about it, will help reduce pain. They can't see it at first when you talk about applying a bandage or a hose kit or a wrap system around their limb. How's that going to help my pain? But you have to educate them about that reduction of the fluid, the venous return, because they can only c understand what you what you're communi you know informing them of and there's lots of patient leaflets around venous disease edema etc that you, you know we haven't got hours and hours but each time every contact with your patient we should all be saying the same thing this is going to reduce the edema this is going in turn reduce the pain okay and use your leaflets use you know most of my patients google oh, that's good or it's bad you know they go on and say oh horse chestnut oil you know yeah shall we put that on but google is a good thing because you can relate them to really good websites patient websites <coughs> charities all good places where they can get information and rightfully so question okay why is my leg also not healed etc and that's how it should be i would be the same i've told you if i come back to stoke you'll all be avoiding me like the plague um but compression we do need okay so how can we encourage that self-care uh, management okay what is the benefits and i'll talk you through the algorithm in a minute of course it's great and involvement in the in the patient's <coughs> treatment and i'm not saying sitting here and talking to all of you saying you don't involve your patients in treatment decision making i know you do okay but it, the more we can encourage that self-care the better for all of us okay we can encourage it by giving them a greater understanding of the disease and I don't I'm not afraid to use that word disease when it comes to VLU <coughs> patients are a bit what do you mean disease but it is a disease okay they're not afraid when you talk about diabetes disease heart disease okay this is a disease and it's empowering a lot of my patients and I'm going to give you an examples of that is it can allow them to help themselves, you know, because we haven't got as much time. And why shouldn't they? They don't want to be waiting for a community nurse, even if they're not going anywhere. They're always afraid to nip to the loo in case you ring the doorbell. They're always on tender hooks, thinking, oh, when they come in, they don't want to go down to the practice, okay? And if they're in the care home, they don't want to necessarily be waiting for you to come and do the dressing, do they? Okay. We're looking at improved outlook and improved um, outcomes for the patients. So certainly for any of you that start recording your, your um, patient reported outcomes, the wound care sequin, I think the next one we'll have will be the leg ulcer sequin. We've got to be showing the outcomes, the improved outcomes for our patients. Re reduce dependence on you guys, okay? Certainly reduce dependence and on their carers and their family members. So let's not forget, VLUs have a big impact on the family and the carers, okay? Less time traveling, less trying for not just DNs, but all you guys out there, okay? And it does, and we prove this, and I'll, I'll talk to you about that in a minute. But how can we make the right decision for your patients? Obviously, I'm gonna use Ian as an example, 
But this is why the leg ulcer treatment algorithm was brought in. We wanted it to be simple, okay? We wanted it to be a tool that even if you kept it in your pocket, laminated as an app on your phone, and I'm hopeless with phones, so I don't do that. It's something that you can use and help you to progress from your assessment through to prevention as well. So if we take Ian, for example, this is, this is a copy of the leg ulcer treatment algorithm. You're all welcome to use it in your practice. Obviously, go through your TVNs, um, go through your managers of your care establishments, and, and you can have it as generic or as, as focused on products as you like. That's individual, so you can name your products on it, on it to help your clinicians to make that decision. But this is very much how the algorithm works, and it's been rolled out uh, across the UK. We're certainly rolling out in Shropshire. So if I start you in point one, as you can see there, we've got Ian. He's got a wound on his lower limb, OK? We've looked at his past medical history and his limb assessment and also history, all that holistic assessment, OK? We're then going to say, are there any signs of venous disease or edema or varicosities or skin changes or ulceration, eczema, hyperkeratosis, all those sort of factors? The answer is no. So the algorithm takes you to consider other causes then, OK? And maybe not necessarily just have to refer, but discuss. Discuss with your tissue viability nurses. Discuss with your colleagues. Ian doesn't fit those boxes. I don't think he's VLU, but if he's got a lower limb ulceration, you've still got to find out what's causing it to get the right treatment in place. If you think it's a dermatology condition, refer to your GP who specialises in dermatology or the dermatologist or your TVN. Okay? If it's lymphedema, still not saying don't compress, but we still have to manage that lymphedema, don't we? If it looks suspicious, malignant, we need to get it biopsied. So speak to your teams. Um, I know we biopsy in the community, but whoever, refer the patient on. As I said before, just because you can't doesn't mean we don't facilitate. Okay? So for any other reasons, if we're thinking arterial disease, of course, and diabetes, then we'll be bringing in those team members or teams, MDT teams we want. Okay? Don't forget the myths and truths, so that all at two weeks um, it becomes a leg ulcer. It is true. So what I'm saying is don't wait four weeks, six weeks, six months. <coughs> I would just say, and I'll still say it, um, and I'll probably see this document being changed in a couple of years' time to say from day one, okay? Any wound to the lower limb. Start thinking of it as a leg ulcer. Okay, so then we move on then, okay? We then do, so if in Ian's case we've got signs and symptoms of venous disease and we haven't got any of those other indicators saying that we think it's something else so we've referred him on, we're moving on now. We've performed an ankle brachial pressure index and you know for those that haven't done it, the Doppler, it's, it's a ratio of pressure from, uh, you, you're working out a ratio of pressure within the ankle um, um, and the brachial. Okay, but don't, don't get undrawn with that. Um, but it is a really good help to indicate if there's any significant arterial disease. Please bear in mind it's not diagnosing venous, but it's telling us it's safe to apply compression. So that's the crux for you as clinicians and for me as a clinician. Okay, so I have an ABPI though that's less... Now these are ours in Shropshire. You will put your own guidance in this, your own local policy, but these are based on national guidance as well. So if the Doppler reading is less than 0.5, we would consider an urgent referral to the TVN team and the vascular team, or the vascular nurse specialists, okay? Because it's telling us there's some arterial disease there significantly. Okay, so we wouldn't compress at that point. We still do that really good times acrimen to remove the barriers of wound healing, but we couldn't compress at that point. Again, 0.5 to 0.8, certainly be thinking some mixed etiology. So there could be some venous signs, but there's some arterial disease. So you refer on to your tissue viability team, vascular nurse, the wider team, okay? And if it's greater than 1.3, the reason there is sometimes there can be calcification. Now, calcification can occur because of diabetes. It can occur because of long-standing venous disease. But what it's saying is you can't truly get a true reading um, because of calcification. All I suggest you, I say all, what I suggest you do there is you talk with your tissue viability team to say, these are the signs and symptoms I have uh, for this patient. This is my reading. Um, they may recommend all the tests just to make sure it's safe to apply compression. They may use their own clinical expertise to say it's safe to apply some compression. 
But in Ian's case, his ABPI was between 0.8 and 1.3, and most all of your VLU patients, you know, that come through this pathway, if they have an ABPI of that, will be. So you're going to move on then. So, but this is the point to remember. Evidence, current evidence, recent evidence suggests only 16% of the patients get to that point. So what's happening to the other 84? And then we wonder why we're busy with lots of leg ulcer dressings. Because if we haven't got to that point, how do we, one, know it's safe to apply therapeutic compression? And two, are they having it? Okay. Um, so just, again, to reiterate that from the myths and truths. So then we move on. Okay. I know that Ian's got an ABPI within what we would say is safe to apply compression. He's got good arterial flow. We've done his wound assessment uh, and his general assessment. Okay, so we're thinking compression now. So here we go, Joy, you were going to tell us about this. So with Ian or any of your patients you're picturing now, think about moisture, okay, and limb distortion. So at this point we say, is the exudate high? You know, is it, or is it controlled within the dressing? In Ian's case, you saw the image of Ian. It was very high. It wasn't controlled within dressings. So that helped us to decide an algorithm that says, right, in that case then, or if there's a lot of limb distortion, as you can see there, we'll apply compression bandaging. Okay. Now, what we use in Shropshire a lot is the inelastic compression bandage system, the Actico and Actico 2C. What we found there is... What we did say to Ian, though, and what we do say to our patients, we are going to apply compression bandaging because it will do this. However, once your exudate levels become in a more manageable level and your limb distortion, because you saw the size of limbs of Ian's limb, is more, um, more controlled, we will then put you in a hosiery kit or a wrap system. So they know they're not going to remain in bandages to healing. And actually, most of your patients will kiss you for it. Okay? because they don't want to. But as a cl clinician now, start thinking, I do not need bandages until the wound is healed. This is the new guidance, okay? So Ian went into bandaging. He needed bandaging. Bandaging is, compression bandaging is so important, okay? Um, until we can get to a point, and I'll show you with Ian, where he could go into the hosiery kit, okay? You reassess your patient, in my opinion, every time you see them. But certainly from a point of view of edema, limb circumference, all of those factors, at least weekly. Okay. So that was Ian's leg. Now, do you understand the rationale why we chose down the algorithm, we went into inelastic bandaging? Okay. Okay. If the exudate at this point, even with bandaging, is not being controlled... Okay, with your dressings, good dressings, and there's no evidence of infection, etc., or increased bacterial, bacterial load. So basically, if you've put the compression therapy on, you've got your wound dressing management in place, and the exudate levels are still high or increasing, okay, do think about infection, bacterial <coughs> burden, okay. It's my debridement methods, okay. Yeah, tick that one. Okay, do I need a topical antimicrobial? Well, I've been using one. Okay, so do I need to swab it because it may need systemic, but I don't jump in with systemic. Okay, so you do that. So you can see it's helping because they're in a good compression therapy. The other factors, if the exudate or the edema is not be, being controlled, please look again at the patient's assessment. Are, am I missing any underlying comorbidities that may be triggering edema in this lower limb? Okay, or uncontrolled edema, such as heart problems, respiratory problems, has anything changed in that patient? But normally, if the exudate is high and not being <coughs> controlled, I'll guarantee that a lot of the time it's due to critical colonisation or infection. Okay, and that's where you will rethink your debridement um, and um, topical dressings as well. So, moisture then. If we move on to the M in moisture, so we just talked about um, a large amount of edema and limb distortion, okay? We put Ian in bandaging because there was, okay? And we said to Ian he would remain in bandages until the limb distortion and the edema was reduced. But let's say it's Pat. I like the name Pat. Have you noticed? I, keep, I don't know anybody named Pat either. Um, but let's say Pat doesn't have a lot of exudate, limb distortion's minimal, okay? 
then I'm going to put her into a hosiery kit. And I know some of you are thinking, oh God, hosiery kits, why, why are you doing that? She's got an active ulcer. Take you back to the Venus Force study, because I'll keep taking you back. The Venus Force study showed hosiery kit, which is a 40 millimetres of pressure. <coughs> That's a hosiery kit, by the way. It's a thera I should have asked you this. How much compression are we looking for for therapeutic in a bandage system? 40-20. Well, this is a hosiery kit that gives 40-20. Okay? So you have a silky liner and you have a sock that goes over the top. Now, I've been nursing a long time, and if you show patients maybe just the sock, they'd say, I can't get it on, I can't get it off, it's difficult, and so would the nurse or the clinician. But the one good thing now, this is therapeutic of 10 millimetres of pressure, but it's silky and it's light, and it really is easy to get on. You can challenge me about the questions in a minute, because I can see a few eyebrows, um, and then this one does go on easier. But you would use this as a bandage in the sense of it remains on, okay? The patient sleeps in it because it's therapeutic compression 24-7, okay? But it's giving that sustained compression all of the time, but it's not a bandage. So, what do you think Pat preferred, the bandage or the hosiery kit? Yeah, so I'm going to move on a little bit further, okay? So when Ian got to a point even less than this, even bigger than this, his wounds were, but can you see his limb shape now is different? But he'd been in hosiery kits at this point, so he was in bandaging for four weeks and then he went into hosiery kits. Okay. How often do you reckon Ian went to the practice? Yeah. Normally in bandaging, it'd be two, twice a week, three times if the exudate levels were high. It was actually self-managing. Okay. Seeing the practice nurse once a fortnight to monitor any signs and symptoms of infection. Okay, but you can see now how we're rethinking the, the, the best practice. What's right for him, what's best for him. So, the other point there is, as I've just said, however, with any compression therapy, with any management of VLUs, if there is no improvement at all with a really good wound management treatment plan in, um, and compression, and there's no reduction. Remember that 30 to 40% reduction in size? Okay, that's where your sizing is important, even just with a paper ruler. Okay, you need to ask advice. You need to ask the advice of your TVNs, okay, or your colleagues who have that wound care experience, okay, because I know we all work so alone sometimes, um, because we really should be, or, or even referring these patients, if you are so lucky to have a leg ulcer clinic in your community, onto the leg ulcer clinics, okay? Because there is a reason, okay? And, and look at that. But that, that, we have to put that in. So over to you guys again. If Ian was a mobile then, so we know he's not, okay? He's quite an active man. Should we have used the inelastic compression bandages then? Seventy-two percent said yes. Twenty percent said no, and some of you are not sure. There has always been a myth that inelastic bandages are not suitable for mobile patients, and I was told that many years ago. Okay, because it, you know, obviously the patients are mobile. Uh, inelastic bandages, you need to be mobile, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The truth of it is that inelastic bandages can be used on both mobile and uh, immobile patients, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, because fluctuations of pressure can be achieved by just the slightest movement. Now, I don't mean patients who have lack of sensation or, uh, you know, you know um, spinal injury patients. Of course, they can't, you know, do, do foot exercises. But here you can see on this, on this slide here um, that even simple ankle flexions, so just literally, as I've had you doing earlier, just flexing your ankle, toe curls, turning your, turning your coat, co toes up, sorry, I'm ready for my dinner, um, sitting up in bed, that those fluctuations of pressure, whether it be small or just passive movements, are enough to encourage that return. So they are suitable. Quite a lot of our patients prefer the inelastic because what also advantage you get is when the patient's active, it relies obviously on the calf muscle pump activity, they get the full compression. When they're actually resting, either sat sitting down or go to bed, the resting pressures are lower, so they actually have some, they find them more comfortable in an evening or at night or when they're resting. Okay, so just, just think of what your patient's needs are. 
These are not my words, these are Ian's words, okay? So Ian went four weeks in bandaging with the, the, with the understanding that when he was ready, when his limb was ready, he would go into the compression hosiery kits. And his words were, as soon as I tried on the hosiery kits, he just felt relieved. <laughs> and his words were, the bits I picked out was that he was more human, more normal and more civilised. And I think that just speaks volumes, doesn't it? And I had a patient, and although he was comfortable in his bandaging, he could do more cosmetically, it was more appealing. And I had a lady who came to clinic who we put into hosiery kit. She came in in bandaging, right treatment, perfect wound dressing management, compression bandaging. Smallish wound, very little edema. And I said to her, and her words were, these bandages and, and I'll tell you when it'll happen <coughs> when the weather gets warmer as well and I said well would, we can put you in a hosiery kit you know we are, you've got I understand you have to look at dexterity and ability but a lot of patients who who haven't got the dexterity or ability to put any hosiery on carers can do it okay family members they can sleep in them and haven't changed once a week by a family member don't be horrified they'd be doing that in the bandaging and what's better to have a healed limb or a non-healed limb um, and my late, the, one of my patients said to me, Joy, she said, really? And I put the, we, we got the kits, so um, we have kits in our clinic, so I measured her, um, recorded it, put in the right kit. And she said, and I said, what, what, how does it mean more to you? She said, well, I've never been married. I'm a very private lady. Don't like discussing what's wrong with me. She said, every time I come to the practice, I go into Morrison's, which was next door. And I go into Morrison's and every time, Stranger, whoever, stops me and said, oh, what's up with your leg? She said, and I don't want to tell them what's up with my leg. I certainly don't want to mention I've got a leg ulcer, because normally, the, you, you know, historically, ooh, one of them, ooh, you never heal that. Ooh, you've got that for life. Ooh, doesn't it smell? She said, and now I can walk into the, into the Morrison's, and I'm hoping nobody will stop me. So I said to her, do me a favour, when you come out to Morrison's, because it was my lunch break about an hour later. I said, I'm going to walk in and get a sandwich. Will you tell me if anybody stops you? So we arranged to meet at the little coffee place. And she stopped me. She said, not one person. Because it looked like hosiery. Now, that sounds little, but you imagine that to her. Nobody is going to stop me and ask me what's wrong. Okay? And again, it freed up time for her as well. So reflecting on practice, these are not my words, because although... I feel I know Ian inside and out. It wasn't my patient, actually. He was another TVN's patient, uh, another clinician's patient, sorry, should I say. And I'm not going to read all this out. This is all, I'm going to direct you to some um, information where you can get all of this from and, and Ian's full story, which is fascinating to read. Um, but as you can see here, this, this clinician was a bit worried because she, she discussed the <coughs> Venus Force study. She knew the findings of it, but was still thinking, oh, kit, is that really going to help to heal an ulcer? So she was a little bit worried when she first pop, popped in into it. But as you can see there, he was completely healed within six weeks. Okay, now that is brilliant. It's brilliant for Ian. It's brilliant for the nurses as well, isn't it? And since then, she's, and I think it is a confidence thing with clinicians, isn't it? You get, the more confidence you have in, in something, the more you'll use it. Um, and since then, she's, it's on a, she, she's introduced the algorithm with this included um, and rolled it out across her area. And obviously, Ian's also healed, but it's not the end of the journey, is it? The end of the journey, well, he will have an end of that part of the journey, but it's ongoing then, good skincare, just washing, creaming, and wearing his compression. Now, if your patient hasn't got dexterity to do all that, we have to facilitate that with carers or, you know, certainly in care establishments. Some of our patients, and please practice nurses, don't shoot me, but some of our practices introduce um, a, a weekly, but it's only for those patients that really have nobody. Um, but the patients come and once a week we'll have their hosiery reapplied um, you know the skin can and then they go off but a lot of our patients although they can't get the hosiery on and off can roll it wipe the skin cream it every day and get the hosiery back up is that wrong it's their limb isn't it okay even your patients with a wound our patients were doing that because a lot of the problem the patients have is the skin gets dry 
and it feels itchy. Now they haven't got bandages on. Why shouldn't they be applying emollients twice a day, once a day? Okay, they can, and I tell you what, they were far more comfortable because the skin didn't feel itchy. Some of our patients with, who could were taking it off every day, creaming it, putting it back on, sleeping in it. Don't need to sleep in it if they haven't got an active ulcer, as long as it's the first thing they put on once they got up in the morning. But not just the hosiery kits, we use a lot of the hosiery, well it's just on our algorithm now, is there, are, there may be some uh, times that you might need a, a Velcro wrap system, uh, the ready wrap. That is important that you consider that and those, those if you haven't seen them, visit the stands, um, visit the Activa stand, they are a, a Velcro wrap system that gives sustained compression. But again, for those patients with dexterity and things, it can be easy to apply. Um, once healed, ongoing okay so a lot of patients will go into what we call maintenance hosiery so like a class two a tight or a thigh length or lacy tops non-lacy the men like the lacy as well but i don't ask them why um you know all those factors quite a lot of our patients remain in the kits because they're confident with them that's up to them okay but they could go to maintenance hosiery where the therapeutic pressures instead of 40 will be around about 25 depending on what system you use but a lot of our patients choose to remain in the kits. And don't forget ongoing, you know, prevention of reoccurrence mm -hmm. isn't that, um, I, know, I, I know we love to discharge patients and that isn't because we're being nasty, that's because of our caseload. But the good practice is that those patients who have recognised VLUs or, having, or are having to wear compression for other reasons, really annually should be uh, reassessed, ABPI, uh, you know, because obviously that can change. Um, and also it's good to encourage that they're continuing to replace their hosiery, wear the cream, you know, put their creams on, etc. Um, we normally say more frequently for that if your patient's got any underlying comorbidities or etiology that questions you to see them a little bit more often. So I'm sorry for the nurses who want to kill me right now because I'm saying you can't discharge them. You can discharge them, but what I'm saying is it's probably good practice if you can bring them back annually because you find your reoccurrence rates will be less. And, and it's good practice because really, you know, who's to say in two years' time their arterial disease uh, level doesn't change, you know, and they don't get some arterial disease. Um, but it's encouraging the patients. So it's not just about the skin care, the hosiery. It is about them as well. So for Ian's case, he did look at addressing his weight. You know, it is encouraging the weight loss. It is encouraging the patients to change their lifestyles you know, and, 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 and the lads in IT to get off their bottoms and stop wheeling across the room. It's, it's for everybody, not just, we, we just keep thinking this younger population, but it's for everybody. Um, and reflecting on our practice, because it was the Venus Force study that made me stop and reflect on our practice and think, oh, you know what, how can we get that right? But it's not a cri criticism to you, because I'm talking to the converted here, because you're all here. Okay, you want to make a difference, you always do, it's part and part of us. But if you can follow the best practice guidance, use it as a tool, use, take out of it the algorithm, take out the, the TIMES acronym, use what you can that's going to help you, because we haven't got a lot of time, I appreciate that. But some of your colleagues couldn't be here today, so share that with them, you know, send them on to, to, to websites. I know Activa, this is all on their website. Don't forget your e-learning modules, the JCN, GPN, do a lot of good e-learning modules. Activa have uh, multiple learning modules, the biofilm pathways on there. Don't reinvent the model. We've just taken the biofilm film pathway, which is talking about debridement, and we've adapted it for our needs in Shropshire because we haven't got time to sit, any TVNs in the audience, we haven't got time to write them all up, so use them. Um, but there's lots of tools out there, that's what I'm trying to say, but try and be consistent with the tools that you all use, okay? And use the e-learning, particularly for your RGNs in the audience revalidation, you know, they are accredited, so use those as well. And that we know ongoing learning is essential, it's not always easy, it's certainly not easy for the face-to-face, um, but you know have a look at the e-learning bits which I tend to have to rely on as well um, and as we say assess dress compress especially when it's your VLUs so any questions from that yes uh, the, the young lady said what, what's the recommendations about redopplering what we normally say is say I've healed or we 
we have healed. The patient's healed, actually. The patient's healed their VLU. We normally say um, ideal 12 weeks, then six months and 12 months. I will say, look at the person. If it's a true VLU, you know they're going to be compliant with the hopefully 100% compliant, then six monthly, 12 monthly. Okay, um, I think you've got to judge your patient, but if there's any un underlying etiology that makes me suggest they're a bit of a higher risk, then I say, you know, three monthly, then six monthly, and then I keep them on six monthly. If it's what we call straightforward VLU, 12 monthly. I wouldn't leave it any longer than 12 monthly either. We, we put, we, I adopted this um, when the Venus 4 came out because I'll just tell you the story very quickly because I had a practice nurse ring me, lovely lady, who said, Joy, I don't know what to do. Very big practice, very, not too far away from here, might I add, but it was a Shropshire practice, who said the GPs have now said it was winter, got all these patients who are poorly, chests and all sorts, we can't bandage anymore, compression bandaging, we've got to stop it. And I was like, what? So what's going to happen to your patients? And it was just as the Venus 4 study was, uh, was being launched. And uh, they said, we haven't got time and we can't bandage. So we, we can see them, but we can't compress them. So I was thinking, this is ridiculous. So my director of nursing phoned me and said, Joy, can you go and sort this, this out? I was nearly said where it was then, but I better not. And uh, I was like, I'm not God and I haven't got a magic wand, but I'll go and see what the issue is. GPs were adamant, even though they, they knew that compression therapy was the gold standard, etc. So what we did is we took their cohort of patients that were in compression bandaging, and there was about roughly just under 20 um, in full compression bandaging. But we equally then looked at the, why they're in reduced as well, and we found that we, most of those were put into full compression. So what we did is we used, the algorithm wasn't out that, but the principle of that algorithm, and we said, right, those with, you know, not highly exuding wounds, limb distortion is quite minimal, straight into the hosiery kit, okay, with dressings, seeing the nurse, et cetera, et cetera. Those that require bandaging, we put into the, the uh, short stretch, um, the acticone uh, bandaging, with a view that once the edema was reduced and the age of eight levels, they would go into a hosiery kit. Two weeks later, the practice nurse phoned me up and said, Joy, Joy, and I was thinking, oh God, because you know, as a lead, you do tissue viability nurse, you do think, oh my God, what have I done? And she said, the patients are cancelling their appointments. And I'm like, right, okay. So I'm thinking, oh God, they've taken everything off and they're not going to bother come back. And, they, and I said, okay, talk to me a couple of, because I'd, I'd, I'd met them by name. I hadn't assessed them all. We made sure they were suitable. <laughs> and they said, well, they, they, his wife's doing it. And then he's going to come back once a week. And I said, have you seen the wound since the wife's been doing it? Yeah, it's lovely. It's really doing well. That's all right then. Yeah, I know, but... And then she phoned me again and said, they're actually coming back in a fortnight now. And I said, as long as you monitor with that patient and give them the support, etc. And it wasn't the patient doing it. It was the wife saying, oh, I'm bringing him up here twice a week. All right, show me what to do. Da, 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 da. Patients were doing it themselves. Patients who couldn't were certainly... We were saying to them, take the socking down, sock down, put your cream on, roll it back up. I can share with you that that cohort of patients, which is just coming up to three <coughs> years now, not one has reoccurred, okay? And they all remained, we gave them options to go in maintenance hosiery, some <coughs> did, but most of them remained in the hosiery kit. Why do you think, and we can't prove this, why do you think those that went into the hosiery kits didn't reoccur? Yeah, they associated the healing of the wound or the ulcer with the hosiery kit. And I think there's a lot, to, there's a lot of work to be done around that. But I think when we put somebody in a bandage and then it heals and we put them into hosiery and say, right, that's for life. I don't think they associate that that's going to prevent that ulcer coming back or it had anything to do with healing the wound. So they'll say, oh, I'm not going to bother with that now because it's gone. So I, I can't prove that, but I think a lot of it is, there's, there's my wound. There's that hosiery kit that come around, or the wrap system. It healed. Brilliant. I don't want to stop it. Okay. I'm not saying you won't have the odd patient. You know, we're all human. But that's the difference it's made to us in Shropshire. And now, a lot of our patients, so a lot of that cohort of patients weren't being seen by the practice nurse, actually being seen by the HCA. And they loved it because they got the time and the passion not that we haven't by the way but they got the time to be doing that debriding 
talking to the patient about the weight loss, putting the hosiery kits on, seeing the wound heal. So the RGM was involved, but she didn't have to see that patient every time. So think of your skill mix, your care homes. As long as that person's had the training and support, you know, and certainly acute hospitals. Have we got any acute staff? I'll be honest and transparent. In Shropshire, we have a problem, but, but we, we, um, Sonny's the new TVN that's just taken over there. And it's great now because what was happening, and, and this wasn't being derogatory ward staff, patients were going in in compression, bandaging, and for other reasons, say abdo pain, I don't know, chest pain, whatever, the bandaging was being taken off or not, as the case may be, and nothing being reapplied. So our patients' lower limb ulcers, VLUs, were not being cared for appropriately. And one of my patients who went in with abdo pain, they solved his abdo pain, but he ended up in ICU with sepsis because his compression was taking off, his leg leaked, it got infected, and nobody knew what to do. Now, that's no excuse, is it? We have to find, we can't, we can't compress. Well, find somebody that can. Speak to your TVN, you know because you can't withhold that treatment just because you don't know how to do it. So what we're working with now, which I understand across the, the remit of acute wards, you can't train everybody. You know, everybody's not going to have them skills. So we're working on this algorithm. This algorithm is going to go into the acute trust as well. And we're going to start then looking at the wrap and the um, hosiery kits, <coughs> which we should be anyway for the, those patients being properly. But then it means the non-qualified staff can be doing that care. Okay, some of our patients have gone in in hosiery kits and the wives have done it. They've said to the hospital staff, look, I know you're busy. I'll do that. Is that wrong? We're just not used to it. Is that wrong that this is the way we're going to go with healthcare? Not really, is it? 